Hey guys, Mr. Antoon here. We are now going to be continuing on for, with 12.4, most likely through 12.8. So what we're talking about today is the shared power with Congress, uh, how the, the president is, it acts as chief legislator, the party leadership that they control, the support that they have to garner from this, and the legislative skills that they bring to the table. So overall, another role of the president, like CEO of the country, every year, other than their first year, they give a State of the Union to a joint session of Congress telling you how things are going. They shape policy through their actions and their, their pulpit, the bully pulpit. Uh, they have the, the loudest voice in our country, obviously. Uh, they review bills. They check power on Congress by either vetoing, signing them into, office, into law, or even pocket vetoing, and I'll talk about that. The line item veto should have a question mark because that doesn't really allow to be happen. They ensure new laws are enforced because... They are the executive branch. They ex execute the laws. The bureaucracy helps them out, and that's Chapter 14. And they can, they can convene Congress at any time they want for emergency matters, a joint session of Congress. It doesn't happen a lot. So over time, you can see Congress and vetoes from the president. So this is kind of a check and a balance. Over time, since the 50s, we see that the trend has been to, to pass less and less bills. So therefore, presidents aren't vetoing as much at all because nothing's really passing because we're so partisan. So here are the three veto ideas that they have. An outright veto, which is constitutionally legal for them to check a law, and then Congress can override that veto with a, with a two-thirds vote in both houses. A pocket veto is they don't sign it, they don't do anything, let's sit on their desk, and then 10 days, uh, if it's within 10 days of Congress adjourns for uh, session, a recess, uh, the bill will die and it'll become called a pocket veto. And then lastly, a line item veto is when you say, Let's say President Trump says, I don't like this in the bill. Get rid of this, this section, and then I'll sign it. Something he doesn't like, you can't do that. Governors can do that for bills for states, but you can't do that at the, at the national or federal level. So this is unconstitutional. So line item veto, just know that that one doesn't work. Um, presidential vetoes. You can see Obama's had 12 regular vetoes, the same as George W., and one veto was overridden. And you can see, again, the numbers are going down because we're passing less and less legislation. And the Trump's numbers are there, but I don't have them off the top of my head. Um, and then here's Trump's line item veto complaint. He's unhappy with the omnibus bill. He says Congress should, re should reinstate the line item veto so he can have a say in it. Just a, just a current event in the sense that happened during it. Again, you can see the trend going down 2015, 2016, the last year of President Obama. Nothing really has been passed. So it's getting worse and worse. Uh, but 2013, you could see the types of laws is under Obama as well. Uh, who is passing what? You could see House Republican, House Democrat, uh, Senate Democrat, Senate Republican. You could see the majority at that point because both houses were Republican. They were passing more of what they wanted, and the president didn't really veto a lot of those. Again, years. You could see again. Here we have. We now have Trump on this list. He has as of. Uh, 115th, his first two years, he had no vetoes at all because he had both houses together with him. So I'm just showing you updated stats with him. And that's the one I just showed you. And then Obama's number only veto that was overridden, he overrode a the 9-11 bill. The 9-11 bill that was passed by Congress said that any American in, on 9-11 that got affected, lost family, property, whatever the may, it may have happened, you could sue those other countries. Obama vetoed it because he said, well, then those countries in turn can sue us, and that could lead to issues. And then Congress overrode him for that, which is really interesting. Uh, first number of laws signed in, the, in, in their first year of office. Notice the numbers are dwindling. The most here was Jimmy Carter, a one-term president. H.W. Bush, a one-term president. Clinton, two terms, W. Bush, two terms, Obama, two terms, and Trump's only been in one term. But this is the first year of office. You're just seeing the numbers. I just want to try to show you that. Now, president has this thing called executive orders. Uh, it's from Article 2. It gives them the vesting clause, and they can now tell the bureaucracy what to do without a law. These are regulations that originate in the, in the executive branch that bypass Congress and give power to control the bureaucracy. So executive orders. Something that you can say from the last two presidents, after 200 days, the Republicans complained about Obama bypassing Congress and passing executive order after executive order because he had six years of a divided Congress. 
He didn't have anybody on his team on his side. Both the House and the, and the Senate were both Republican. Now, Trump, in his first two years, he had both sides, but he wanted to pass a lot of legislation right away, or a lot of orders right away, to show his, that he's working hard. You can analyze it how you want. They, the, the Republicans complain Obama did this, and now Trump does this, and they don't complain about Trump doing that. So is it a political party battle? It sounds that, that way. Depending on which side you're at, you either say, oh, I agree with it, or I disagree with it. Um, and then our executive orders through October 13th, you can see from, this is about six or seven months, you can see, again, Trump uh, leads the pack, or, you know, as of recent, he's had the most. Um, executive order, approval of executive orders, you can see on this side, um, these are some of the executive orders that are out there. Uh, government agencies to delay or ignore elements of the Affordable Care Act, approve or disapprove. You can see how people uh, reacted to his, his orders. Scrapping past president's orders. Ray, you can see a number of orders revoked by president since FDR. Reagan's had the most. Obama is now, that's what Trump has done in his first time, part of office, is getting rid of a lot of Obama stuff. And then if Biden wins, I bet you they get rid of all of Trump stuff. And this is how we continue to battle partisanship in our country. Uh, Trump beats Obama on executive order. Just another chart. You can pause these at any time if you want to look through them, but you can see year one of President Trump at 55 to 39, 37 to 35, and 38 to 34. So he wins the game, but the game is that becomes makes you too powerful if you if you don't go through Congress to create these orders. It's interesting to think about that. So let's well, let's look at a little more detail on what an executive order is, because a lot of people might be confused with an executive order and an executive agreement. So this one's 446. If you want to skip it, you can skip ahead about five minutes. It's up to you. So when does a president use an executive order? Sometimes a president feels the need to exert power without working with Congress. And in times of crisis, quick decisions can be justified. But most executive orders are not responses to emergencies. They're often directed towards agencies in the federal government in order to expand or contract their power. Others determine the extent to which legislation should be enforced. And sometimes, a president may use an executive order to clarify and help implement a policy that needs to be easily defined. Some of the most famous executive orders have changed the course of American history. FDR issued an executive order to establish the Works Progress Administration, which helped build thousands of roads, bridges, and parks throughout the country. The WPA also employed thousands of writers, painters, sculptors, and artists to create works of art in public spaces. Additionally, Harry Truman used an executive order to desegregate the armed forces in 1948. And in 1965, Lyndon Johnson signed an executive order to establish requirements for non-discriminatory practices in hiring and employment. Executive orders have often been used in positive and inclusive ways, but they've also been used to exclude and divide. One of the most notable examples being FDR's 1942 executive order. He gave the military authority to target predominantly Japanese Americans, as well as German Americans and Italian Americans in certain regions across the country. This executive order also removed any or all of those people into military zones, most commonly known as internment camps. Beginning in the early 1960s, each president has issued roughly 300 executive orders, but FDR issued over 3,500. At the other end of the spectrum, William Henry Harrison never issued an executive order, probably because his presidency only lasted 31 days. The U.S. Constitution is somewhat ambiguous on the extent of the president's power. That's resulted in executive orders expanding over time. For instance, since Lyndon Johnson, presidents have begun issuing orders to create faith-based initiatives, establish federal agencies, and remove barriers for scientific research. There are checks and balances in the U.S. political system. Congress can pass laws to counteract executive orders, and judges can halt them by deeming them unconstitutional. But in the time it takes for those things to happen, an executive order can go into effect and possibly change the course of history, for better or for worse. 
Okay, so hopefully that helped you guys with that. Again, you could see how each president will target each other here. So Obama targeted Bush, who targeted Clinton, and that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to get rid of it, and that's what bases want. I don't like Trump, so let's get rid of all of his stuff. No, I don't like Obama. Let's get rid of all his stuff. This is what happens. Presidents have a right to do this. They're in office because of the Electoral College and the indirect vote from Americans. So they have a mandate to do this, and they choose to do this to make their, their base happy. Whether that works for our country or not, again, you guys have to analyze that side of it. So you can see here a political cartoon that shows you Congress is sitting on, you know, it's behind and doing nothing but just casually doing because it it's run by the GOP here. And Obama's trying to work hard. So he's passing executive orders and saying, no, no, that's my job. Don't do it. And that's where the power comes, where Republicans at the time really were upset about Obama doing this. And now you can flip it for Trump doing it and Democrats being pissed off. Again, a, a lot rarer. You can see it going back all the way to George W. Bush. This was in 2014. Just the numbers. I'm just trying to show you a bunch of stuff to see, get you some ideas for it. So let's talk about party leadership now um, and the bonds of party and the support of party. It seems like we've become so partisanship. Uh, leadership is important. So he's, the president is the chief of party, another role of the CEO of this country. And they're the leader of that party. And it's the unwritten constitution because we know what James Madison felt about um, the factions or parties. He's thinking that they're going to cause problems, and they have. And we haven't really listened to that side of it. So with party leadership, uh, they lead the party. Uh, there's this thing called president, presidential coattails, where it's the tendency for, if the president's a popular president, he's going to bring and help out a lot of people in lower offices anywhere across our nation and bring in and swing a lot of people. So it's coming in on coattails. Trump did this, so did Obama. So they, they seem to do that because they become the popular one. And you could see in 2018, this affected in a negative sense where Trump lost these famous seats as a result of that. And we'll see what, if it happens again in 2020. But again, this happens normally throughout. And you can see on average, congressional gains or losses for the presidential party in election in presidential election years. So going down at the bottom, you can see um, Trump's average is minus seven in 2016 uh, in the House. And then you can see uh, in the Senate, he lost two seats on average during his election year election year okay so you can see again the numbers might, might be the exact but this is what he has the average at the bottom here it's usually you gain eight seats and you gain one seat in the senate so it can go either way here's the midterm election losses trump lost 36 seats and gained two senate seats but look at obama's 2010 midterm he lost 63 seats in the house because he passed obamacare and americans went crazy okay and that's why they they, they pushed him out Again, just more statistics. I'm not going to go through too much of this, guys. I just want you to have a chance to look through some of them if you want to. Uh, should we increase the president's legislative powers? And these are, this is kind of a poll that was taken to say yes or no towards that. And it says presidential win rate on votes in Congress. And then you can see the year of Congress here. Um, so we're, you, know, you can see the win rate at first because he passed a lot of stuff, Obama, in his first two years because he had both chambers of Congress. And then all of a sudden he lost it in the, in the midterm in 2010 and then less and less got done. That's usually what happens. Two indicators for public support for a president. Number one, it's a mandate. We, I've already said this. If the public likes the incumbent and their policies, they vote them back in. Well, a lot of people who are Trump's base and his fans love him, think he's one of the greatest presidents. But on the other side of the fence, a lot of people don't think, I think he's abrasive think his tweeting is wrong and how he bullies the country and he calls people names. He does things that are not of norm as a president. They can vote him out. So again, the mandate, because he won the election, he has a mandate to run this country, whether you like it or not. Okay, and he gives, gives that mandate to continue their to pass those policies. And then polling, we ask the public their opinion and then we get responses. So presidential job approval rating after one month. Overall, Trump, one of the worst ones in our in recent memory, if not all time, he's at 40%. And you can see, look at the difference between Democrats and Republicans. Obama, 64% in the first month, 89% Democrats and 32%. It is so partisan, it's disgusting to look at this and say we're Americans. It's like two different countries. However you want to look at that. Okay? Approval rating since Kennedy, and they spelled Kennedy wrong. I don't know if you noticed this. Minus points for that. 
So you can see Kennedy, presidents usually start out higher and then end out lower. Look at Nixon down to 30%. Ford, I, I'm surprised. Carter, again, lower. Reagan, he ended up almost higher than he started. And then Bush ended up lower. Clinton, look at this. He ended up higher than he started. The man was impeached. George W. Bush, 9-11, boom, all the way down to the end because of the economy. Obama rescuing the economy, Obamacare, kind of the same. He ended up higher than he started, and Trump started out less than 50%, and now he hovers around 40 to 45%. 12.5, uh, the president in national security policy. So uh, he's the chief diplomat. He's the commander-in-chief. He has war powers, and he becomes this crisis manager in times of need as a country. Um, he also works with Congress during this. So as the chief diplomat, he meets with foreign leaders. He's the number one diplomat to diplomacy with other countries. He negotiates treaties. He doesn't, he doesn't ratify them. That's Congress. Like the Middle East peace agreement he just had in 2020. He establishes foreign policy. He represents the United States wants and needs. I don't know if I apostrophe S that correctly. Um, like the Paris Climate Accords. He got out because he feels we shouldn't be in... Climate change is a hoax to him. It's not real, but let's get out of it. But let's look on the other side of it. He's a businessman who has a lot of business friends, and they're getting punished and fined for all the stuff that they do in their factories. So he got rid of us in that, and the EPA has came, come, gotten rid of those regulations, so they're making more money, but they are polluting our world. Again, that's how you have to look at it. Uh, he appoints and receives ambassadors of our country and other countries, and he can create these executive agreements like he did with the Middle East Peace Agreement. Uh, you can see Jimmy Carter in the 1980s, 1970s, late 70s, with uh, um, Menachem Begum and Anwar Sadat. You can see them working on a Middle East peace agreement. Um, international agreements, you can see. Look at, look at, uh, let's look at the numbers. Reagan had 2,840, 125 treaties. Barack Obama weighed less. And I don't have Trump's number on here because it's been four years, but I didn't find it at the time. Uh, he's also the commander of chief of our military branches. He leads them. He can deploy troops where he wants for about 90 days, but he has to give Congress, uh, he has to communicate with Congress on that because they have to appropriate funds for that. And then the framers didn't envision a standing army and their concerns about now a nuclear arsenal. It wasn't in the constitution. So these are things that are kind of nebulous or gray that we just don't know how to, how to deal with it. And you can see Obama here with his war powers. Look at Bob. Obama and Biden and Hillary Clinton were Secretary of State. This was the moment uh, that we went in the raid to get Osama bin Laden, and eventually they, they killed him there and buried his body at sea so there could be no memorial towards him. But again, this was that moment. They have the power to do this. Um, so I'm going to want you to watch this War Powers one because we're going to do an activity in class. But this is a really good one um, where in 1973, Richard Nixon and, and was bombing Cambodia and Laos, and Congress didn't want him to have these powers. They wanted to negotiate more and check and balance. And he said, it's an executive privilege for me to do this. So they said, you need to seek out uh, congressional approval before you do anything. So it's 90 days total. It's, you have to notify you're sending troops to Congress within 48 hours, and then you have 60 days with 30 days to bring them back. Okay, there has to be a declaration of war, which we have not had since World War II. Something to think about there. So I wanna play this video, it's four minutes. And again, another good one. Um, this is History Channel. The War Powers Resolution. All right, so what you're seeing here is, look at the declared and undeclared wars we've had since 1812. In red, it's declared, that means Congress declared them. And then the other ones are, are undeclared wars. That means that Congress appropriates the funds, gives the money, but it's never a declaration of war. And we can go back, I remember when I was 21 in 1991, the Gulf War, it was not declared. And I was scared to, to, be, to, go, to have a draft to go because it was a war to stop a, a dictator. That was a quick war. And then we have Afghanistan and Iraq. We, we have all these, um, it feels like imperialism, if you study imperialism, where we have all of our troops in other countries, but it's no declaration of war. It's like we're the policemen of the world. Again, you could think that's positive or negative, however you want to look at that. Uh, they, they, the president acts as crisis manager, and, and I want you to think about why are, they more, why are they more equipped to handle a crisis than Congress is? So what constitutes a crisis? Obviously, the Cuban Missile Crisis in the 1960s, 9-11 uh, in 2001, you could say uh, um, those are big events that probably affected us. To some extent, I would say coronavirus. 
But again, Trump didn't really act like a crisis manager as much as he, as, as he says he has because he didn't have a mandate for our country to wear masks. He said it was a hoax at first. Or he said the Democrats were making this up to be a hoax and it wasn't real. So it seems like he's just kind of saying it's, it, is, was it, it is what it is and we have to grin and bear it while we lose over 200,000 people. And they, they, they have modern, they use modern communication technology today to make it easier for them to lead. Because really, in all honesty, because this is the question, why are they more equipped? They're, they're, they can instantly react and instantly do things like executive orders. Even though they can be checked later on, they can take care of something right now if they need to be. It's one person versus this huge bureaucratic Congress. Rapid action, uh, constant management, expert advice. Congress always moves slowly, and that's because that's how the founding fathers set it up, guys. So you can see here Bush in 9-11. He went down there. Congress didn't. Even though Congress gave lots of money for this event, uh, Bush could do it immediately. And that's why they're a better crisis manager than Congress. And, he, and we have this idea of how they work with Congress or how they work with the world. It's considered this idea of two presidencies, the domestic and the foreign one. And on the left, you can see uh, Trump with Putin from Russia. Uh, it's how he deals with foreign policy. Well, he seems to not be as hard on these dictatorial countries as North Korea, because he talks really highly of Kim Jong-un, um, and, and, and Russia, who most of us don't agree with because they're dictators. So why does he have affinity for that? And yet he wants to get out of NATO and the UN, most of our allies since World War II. It's really interesting. But again, he has a right to do these things. But it's something you need to think about. And then it's how we deal with domestic policy. And I only wanted to bring this up to cause controversy in Trump's inauguration and Obama's inauguration, which they made a big deal in the first week, saying it was the biggest inauguration ever. And that's obviously not the biggest inauguration ever. But again, that's what Trump wants us to believe in, in, in terms of his popularity. But it's just something to think about. Uh, presidents can claim national emergencies. You can see right now, Trump's had three national emergencies as of February of 2019. Obama. You can see he had 10 and so on. I'm not going to go through each one of them. But the president can declare this that allows them to divert money from other programs to this urgent matter. And for Trump, he did this for the wall. You can see the current national emergencies that are still going on that haven't been declared not you know emergencies anymore. Um, so the question is, if Trump calls the border crisis, which really is not a crisis according to most, what's going to happen to the next president? If the next president says climate control, national emergency. Uh, if the next president says uh, DACA, national emergency. It also, it just waters down this idea of what emergency actually is. Because if you look at the numbers, look at the numbers of apprehension on the U.S.-Mexico border up to 2018. The numbers have gone down. Obama had more in 2016 during his time. So it's not as high as it is. So it isn't really a national emergency at, at that point. But Trump does say it is. And he has a right as a president to say that. It's just how we look at it. Uh, they also give State of the Union's addresses where they tell us how the country is annually, um, except their first year, obviously. And look, in the, in the Constitution in Section 3, Article 2, Section 3, he said he shall from time to time give to the Congress information of the State of the Union. So he meets with a joint session of Congress, and it's really patting themselves on the back the whole entire time, guys. It's, it's for any, any president. If you don't like Obama, Obama did this for eight years. If you don't like Trump, he did the same thing for the last three years. Okay? He should, he should give another one if he wins in 20, 2021. Okay, and you can see here, this is when they had the houses together. And then here's Nancy Pelosi. When Trump finished his State of the Union in 2019, no, no, this year, 2020, she ripped up his speech right in front of him as everyone's clapping. Caused a firestorm. Whether you, again, you can agree or disagree with what she did. And again, let's watch the highlights from it because I want you to see some of the stuff that they talk about because it should be about America, but it's very partisan at times from any speech. But here's Trump's speech. It's about three minutes. The state of our union is strong. But we must reject the politics of revenge, resistance and retribution and embrace the boundless potential of cooperation, compromise, and the common good. An economic miracle is taking place in the United States, and the only thing that can stop it are foolish wars, politics, or ridiculous 
partisan investigations. No one has benefited more from a thriving economy than women who have filled 58% of the newly created jobs last year. You weren't supposed to do that. We also have more women serving in Congress than at any time before. Now is the time for Congress to show the world that America is committed to ending illegal immigration and putting the ruthless coyotes, cartels, drug dealers, and human traffickers out of business. We would right now, in my opinion, be in a major war with North Korea. But my relationship with Kim Jong-un is a good one. Chairman Kim and I will meet again on February 27th and 28th in Vietnam. Here in the United States, we are alarmed by the new calls to adopt socialism in our country. We are born free and we will stay free. In the past, most of the people in this room voted for a wall, but the proper wall never got built. I will get it built. Okay, so just some highlights from his last one here, guys. And you can see afterwards, a CBS poll says people who watched it on CBS, YouGov did this, they approved of his speech. And then there's the identification whether or not there were more Republicans than watched it because, again, it's a Republican president, so they're going to give a higher marks anyways. 43% were Republican, 24 Democrat. So not really, but it's just a, a sample of, of what happened. Most of those speeches, guys, are written in, in advance and they're reading off a teleprompter. I'm going to be honest. If I had a teleprompter, if I had stuff in my classroom, man, it would be easy to do. And I would sound really a lot better than I do. Okay, so because of time, we're going to skip uh, six, seven, and eight, and we're going to do those as the last video because this was a long section. I will see you on the next one, guys.